research and innovation, particularly is the approval both of the national roadmap for the integration of the Republic of Moldova in the European research area and the national program for research and innovation for 2020-2023. And a new challenge for us is the association to the next European framework program for research and innovation, Horizon Europe, which means also our continuous integration in the European research area. I would like to mention that during the bilateral discussions between the Minister of Education, Culture and Research of Moldova and the Deputy Director General of Directorate General Research and Innovation, which took place within the Eastern Partnership Annual Conference on Research and Innovation on 21st of October in Chisinau, the Minister of the Republic of Moldova expressed the intention of the Association of the Republic of Moldova to the next European Union framework program. Horizon Europe will be structured in three pillars supported by activities aimed at widening participation and strengthening the European research area, one of which is Innovative Europe, focuses on stimulating, nurturing and deploying disruptive and market-creating innovations and on enhancing European ecosystems, encouraging to innovation, including through the new European Innovation Council. We would like to express our gratitude to the European Commission representatives for the European Innovation Council Roadshow in Moldova. I am sure we will have a productive day today and I hope we will be able to share our experience and expectations for the future. Thank you and now I am honored to give the floor to Mr. Marco Gemer, delegation of the European Union to the Republic of Moldova for welcome remarks. Estimates Olga, uh, dear colleagues, friends, uh, having our colleagues uh, from the Director General for Research and Innovation of Brussels here just five uh, weeks after the Deputy Director General was here, I think underlines the commitment that the European Union has towards uh, the people of the Republic of Moldova to connect people, to bring communities together in order to help uh, Moldovan society prosper. Uh, what you will hear in the, in the introductions from the colleagues Cornelius and Andres is that uh, innovation is something different than what was previously done, been done in research and innovation. Uh, there's many more opportunities coming, also different ways of being engaged. And uh, I mention this because I would like to highlight a bit uh, the, maybe the past five, six years, how the cooperation between Moldovan researchers uh, worked in, with European research institutes. And as Olga mentioned, uh, the people of the Republic of Moldova have a privileged partnership with the European Union through the association agreement, through the um, deep and comprehensive free trade area, and also the visa travel regime, or the, the free travel regime. 
And it's about uh, the leaderships on both sides to make the best use of it. So all the preconditions are in place to have an active research and innovation landscape here for Moldovan researchers, but also the innovators. In the past, the delegation has supported the participation of Moldovan researchers and, and um, students in the framework program seven, but also in other schemes, such the, the um, researcher mobility schemes, Erasmus, Erasmus Plus. And we have recently also topped up with our bilateral um, cooperation, the participation and the opportunities that Moldovan researchers have under Erasmus Plus. So this is one of the examples where we work to bring you closer together to your peers in the European Union, but I dare say also to the peers in the other Eastern Partnership countries because uh, you also have access through the Eastern Partnership Education Panel to have a peer exchange with your, with your colleagues in Ukraine, in Georgia, the other two countries who have an association agreement with the European Union, but also other countries. Because your access to Horizon 2020 right now allows you European access, but also all the um, exchange with the other countries which are asso associated to Horizon 2020. Uh, and this is what we will continue promoting here in the Republic of Moldova as a delegation. You are aware that we have uh, support for s small and medium-sized enterprises, because I think this is one of the topics of uh, innovation. It's not only about research, it's really the innovation part. And I will not talk about it more because the experts are here at the table. Um, and we have seen a slow increase of activity of small and medium-sized enterprises. The European Union has supported this creation of small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, mingling of enterprises together with research and innovation for the benefit of the citizens, because the more small and medium-sized enterprises we have active in the different fields, including in the innovation sphere, the more re uh, revenue they will generate and the more employment they will cre create here in the Republic of Moldova. Uh, Moldova is a relatively small country with many challenges, but this is why we are here to support you. If it was easy, we weren't here. Very often we hear it's very difficult, yes, but we are here to support the Moldovan people to have access to have the same opportunities that our researchers and innovators have in the European Union. This is what I would like to underline, and this is our, one of our objectives, to have the same opportunities for you than your colleagues in the European Union and the other countries associated to Horizon 2020 have. And I'm very happy that uh, with the European Innovation Council, with the activities, there will be new op opportunities for you on different levels. And it will not be easy, but you can count on our support to be connected with your peers, to have an exchange with your peers, so that uh, not only the economy, but also the society at large can grow here in the country. Thank you very much for being here, and I hope you will all uh, reap the benefits of the opportunities that my colleagues are bringing to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Grammer. Grammer, excuse me. And now I think we should can begin with our presentations. Yes, and I give the floor to Mr. Cornelius Schmaltz with his first presentation, the policy rationale of European Innovation Council, introduction to the European Innovation Council. Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today to tell you about innovation and our plans um, for the European Innovation Council, the current pilot and the future full-fledged Innovation European Innovation Council in Horizon Europe. It's a great pleasure to be here in Chisinau. Thank you very much to our hosts from the Ministry um, for Education, Culture and Research, in particular to Olga who has been instrumental in preparing this visit. Thank you very much. So, um, we will indeed, f I will try to set out a little bit the background, the motivation, the rationale of the European Innovation Council, and then we will go in two presentations together with my colleague um, Andres into the more technical and implementation details of um, how to apply, how does it work, what's in it for the researchers and the innovators. So, if we um, start really the rationale, the idea behind the European Innovation Council is the realization that 
Europe has a very strong research base but is not able the same extent as our competitors in the US and Asia to really commercialize these ideas and to transform them into prosperity and wealth. We think that there are three big um, stumbling blocks that hold back um, European innovators. One is, of course, the innovation performance. That's a lack of breakthrough and disruptive innovations that actually create new markets. The second one is the innovation funding. We see that there's a big financing gap between R&D grants and private investments for scaling up innovative startups between us and our um, main competitors. And the last one is, of course, the ecosystem. Um, we do have a single market, but it is not as unified um, as um, are the big markets in China or the US. And we see that these ecosystems in Europe have a great diversity, and we need to be able to make that a strength and to connect them rather than to see them as fragmented. If we can have the next slide. Um, and we can just, yeah, so that the full slide is visible. I think there's two or three um, clicks there. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So we can see um, the different waves of innovation. If we look into the past, we have a very strong Europe in areas such as electricity, cars, antibiotics, um, synthetic chemicals. That's traditional strength of European innovation. We have the current wave that is very much digital-based with things like digital platforms, the cloud, internet, blockchain, um, where I think there is little um, doubt about the fact that the US has very much led this and now upcoming Asia. And the big question is who will lead in the future where we have things like gene therapy, um, liquid biopsies, autonomous vehicles, quantum computing. And that's really the race that is now open and where we want as European politicians would like to do what we can in order to give Europe a good starting position in this area. We can have the next slide. I think there might be two more yeah, clicks on that one and then the next one. Um, this demonstrates the very substantial financing gap in venture capital um, between the US and EU. You can see that the European venture capital is growing in recent years, um, but equally and to a much greater proportion, venture capital in the um, US grows, and we still have a ratio of at least five to one between venture capital available in the US and the EU. And with the European Innovation Council, one of our goals is to change a little bit that ratio. Next slide. This is um, a last picture on the current situation. This depicts the unicorns in the US, Europe, and Asia. Um, and you can see um, that um, Asia, and you, if you look at the numbers in particular, Asia between 2015 and 2017 is growing. US is slightly declining, and Europe is stable, but at a very low level with a very small numbers um, of um, unicorns. And the next slide um, shows the ecosystems with the biggest um, start-up cities, um, hubs, clusters in Europe. And you can see, of course, big clusters there in um, London and Paris, in Berlin, in Stockholm, in Barcelona, in Madrid. Um, but you see that this is many, many different circles that we need to create better at all levels, at the levels of the start-ups, of the um, finance behind it, and of course also the research um, in innovation base. So our idea in the next slide is with the European Innovation Council to tackle all these issues in order to create a one-stop shop for breakthrough and disruptive in innovators, which should be important to all possible innovators, ranging from traditional um, actors in the field of research to the unconventional, um, literal um, inventor in his garage, with the highest potential innovators selected on the basis of ideas and teams. We want to offer since I see people taking photos, we will, of course, be very happy to make that presentation available afterwards to the ministry so that it can also be distributed to the participants. We want to have agile funding from the idea to the investment. You will hear more about this in detail about the Pathfinder grants for advanced research on emerging technologies. We then have the single company funding in the accelerator funding for small and medium enterprises with 2.5 million, up to 2.5 millions of grants and 
and new now in this round of the pilot up to 50 million of equity and very much we don't want to do that in a way to crowd out private investment but in the contrary with our investment we want to crowd in additional private investments and we want to make efforts to build ecosystems and communities by giving access to mentoring and advisory services and to knowledge partners also not only within the EU funded ecosystem but also to national systems. We are in the process of hiring program managers um, based on the DARPA model to engage with projects and communities and we have also um, put out a number of prices to have a different way of funding innovation. The last two or three slides, no, we have a few more, but um, give you an overview of um, the um, history of the European Innovation Council. The first phase was launched in 2018 by building, of course, on existing funding schemes, the SME instrument, the Fast Track to Innovation, the FET Open and Prices, which we had also started early in Horizon um, 2020, the introduction of open support for startups and SMEs, the introduction of interviews before in the accelerator um, companies were selected based on um, written evaluation only. We now have a jury of high-level innovators who actually see all these companies or like the best of the ones from the written evaluation and do an interview and select the very best. Um, and we had also the launch of major prizes for breakthrough innovations such as a low-cost space launcher and artificial photosynthesis. We have received a lot of applications in this first pilot from SMEs for the SME Phase 2 grants. We had very interdisciplinary applications. Um, the interview process, the juries um, were a big success. Um, we had a fast process and we had a total budget of 778 million in 2018 for all EIC pilot actions. And if we go to the next slide, um, we can see that in 2019 that budget increases further to one billion this year and to 1.2 billion in next year and actually we have some hope that with the finalizing budget negotiations for 2020 that will be increased even a little bit further so I think we're approaching 1.3 billion now with the latest budget negotiations. Um, we int have introduced now the new terminology for the instruments to bring them even closer. We now have an EIC pilot FAST finder which covers the previous um, FET open and FET project. Active. Um, we have the introduction pilot accelerator, which covers the old SME instrument. We have very importantly introduced the opportunity of applying for blended finance, combining grant and equity, and you will hear more details about this. We have a very nice high-level EIC advisory board that, board that should give us direction and steering on the best way to support innovators in Europe. And we, as mentioned, we're just in the process of hiring the first EIC program managers who should take an active role in managing portfolios of projects. Next slide. The major novelties, as mentioned in the EIC, is um, the blended finance. We have um, added 100 million in budget. Um, that is reserved for equity, but we actually see that we will go beyond these 100 million um, and use part of the grant budget also for equity um, in order to particularly allow SMEs to scale up, because this is what we actually see as the big problem in Europe. Interestingly, we have equal numbers of startups in the US and in Europe, so this is not the problem. The problem is for these startups to grow then, so this is what we want to tackle with the equity. I've mentioned the amounts that we have in grant and equity, and this is from early commercial to market deployment and scale up. That's also the advantage of equity. Grant money you can only use for technical. TRL stands for technological readiness levels, six to, uh, for up to TRL eight. The equity you also can also use for commercializing. This is what allows companies to grow, um, to scale up. And next slide, yes, we have the EIC program managers who will look after a more flexible and proactive management and steering of tech or challenge-based portfolios. We will have eventually five program managers to follow these projects in the mostly in the EIC Pathfinder pilot, but. 
ready with a look out to the accelerator. These are professionals with visionary thinking, which will be hired as temporary commission staff. Temporary because we think it is important that there is this brain circulation between academia and industry and the commission to really bring in fresh ideas and fresh blood. And we have the EIC advisory board, which should advise the commission on the design of the European Innovation Council. It's a group of 22 entrepreneurs, investors, individuals building startup communities, innovative researchers and academics working on innovation policy who will support the Commission in developing the pilot um, this year and next year, enhancing innovation ecosystems and the impact and advising us also on the overall strategy in the future framework program for research and innovation horizon Europe. The next slide gives you an overview of the people in this um, EIC advisory board. It's really impressive. I've seen these people recently in two events and it's very impressive to see how engaged they are, how positive they are. Um, some of you might be aware of the slush fair that just happened last week in Helsinki, one of the major startup fairs. We had many of the people there and the overall atmosphere was extremely positive towards these attempts of the European Innovation Council. So I think we have really succeeded in building a brand that still of course needs to now demonstrate the value that it has promises but there's a lot of hope and a lot of um, promise and a lot of positive um, vibes towards this new um, innovation council. And the last slide shows you our plans for the full EIC under Horizon Europe with a proposed, you all know that the negotiations on Horizon Europe um, are very far advanced but that the program still hasn't been adopted, that we now have the new parliament and um, the new commission who need to finalize these negotiations. But most things, we hope that the agreement that has been found with the previous parliament will basically stay. There are a few issues that still need to be finalized. Um, among them, of course, the budget, which is subject also to the overall agreement in the multi-annual financial framework program um, that the le European leaders are currently discussing. We have proposed a budget of 10 billion for the European Innovation Council. Um, as mentioned, we have a dedicated governance with, it, with this advisory board and an EIC president. We have proposed more flexible rules for funding with an increased role for expert program managers. We have now a full accelerator funding with both grant and blended finance. Um, we have the Pathfinder scheme for grants in advanced research and transition activities. We have fast track access for Horizon grant holders including the European Research Council. The ERC, ERC, which in many ways is a model brand for the European Innovation Council and also certified national schemes. And we will create an EIC forum with member states um, in order to discuss with innovation agencies how we can better link the European innovation ecosystems. Thank you very much. I'll give the floor to Andres, who will present the Pathfinder um, scheme. I will then present the Accelerator, and then we'll have um, a panel and also, of course, open for questions. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm here to present the Pathfinder, uh, which is basically the first part of our, yeah, one of the two legs of the AC. So the Pathfinder, so you know, covers, let's say, the upstream dimension of the uh, innovation process, uh, covers from tier one up to tier six, and basically it's uh, it's an instrument that is built upon the uh, experience of Fed Open and Fed Proactive, and and basically it doesn't change that much. What it changes is the amount of money that we have available that you can see in that slide is a uh, pretty significant and and basically we are trying to build an instrument with the IC that covers both the advanced research dimension and also the scale up dimension which is the accelerator that my colleague Cornelius will explain later and uh, if we can move to the next slide uh, one more uh, so as uh, my colleague mentioned, Europe has a really good advantage as regards other uh, jurisdictions like Asia, the US and, and so on, is that we have a good research phase and moreover we have a good industrial research phase. So uh, we are trying to uh, provide support to those uh, innovators, researchers at universities, at uh, let's say um, uh, 
research institutions that have the good ideas and they want to make those ideas re uh, yeah, a reality and from then on move into uh, let's say creation a company and so on so the Pathfinder will cover the, the I mean the first part of the innovation process so the actual testing of the idea the you know the research the uh, the fundamental research of course we are looking here at uh, deep tech innovation we are not looking at just incremental innovation incremental innovation meaning using existing innovation but just adding like improvements we are here looking at something which is totally disruptive which is also uh, changing markets changing society but also for the good so this is what we are aiming to and uh, where we are trying to support with the Pathfinder uh, and also one important thing about the Pathfinder is that we are uh, aiming at increasing collaboration and interdisciplinarity of research meaning that we want to connect innovators at uh, research institutions at universities with corporations uh, also with companies and so they can collaborate together and, and, and actually build connections and, and, and learn from each other so this is also a big important part of the, of the, yeah, of the Pathfinder it's not only money it's also learning and this is quite important I would say because if you have good connections and you can let's say uh, develop your idea through these connections that's also important and it's not only the money Excellent. So yeah, novelties. Uh, as I said, the Pathfinder covers uh, the former uh, instruments called Fed Open and Fed Proactive. Um, as I mentioned, it, uh, it goes from early research, proof of concept, to the actual uh, creation of a demonstrator or a, or a uh, pilot or a, or a tester. Um, and and now these these. Uh, yeah, this FED program is integrated into the, into the Pathfinder pilot. Uh, why we call it pilot? Because we are still uh, testing how we can, let's say, integrate both the da downstream dimension and the upstream dimension, so the uh, Pathfinder and Accelerator, and how we can connect bridges between them and also other instruments at the EU level. And for that, to, to have this clear idea of where we are going and how we will fund projects, we have, of course, hire, or we're in the process of hiring program managers. That's actually what explained my colleague. Um, they're basically people that have the good ideas, they have a vision, and they can, uh, let's say, pick projects and decide which projects will get funding and in which direction these projects they should move. So it's also, the idea is to, uh, let's say, not look at the short term, like giving the money and just that's it, but just looking what we can get from that in the next 10 10, 15, 20 years. This is a bit the model that was already uh, um, um, introduced in the US with DARPA and ARPA. -E. So we are just trying to learn from, yeah, from Americans and other um, countries and ju jurisdictions. Uh, about how we can foster uh, innovation and also uh, take uh, yeah, having in mind that we want to foster innovation for the greater good to create companies and also uh, to yeah, to bring ideas to the market that they make life for Europeans better um, that's it one more so um, as I mentioned, uh, the conditions for applying and getting funding from the EAC Pathfinder, there are the following, like there is a certain, um, let's say, uh, we call it gatekeepers, and those are the following, which you can see there, uh, for receiving funding uh, during the evaluation phase, this project, this idea, uh, presented by a potential beneficiary, has to have a radical vision. So this is, again, what I mentioned about the future, trying to change the future, trying to open new markets, develop new technologies. Uh, that they are breakthrough, so that they actually change the way we see technology and the way uh, you know we do uh, industrial research and so on. And of course, there's the uh, element on interdisciplinarity, meaning that here we want to connect the university world, the academic domain, with industry and with companies, with the business domain as well. And uh, um, I, yeah, the Fed uh, Open used to be an open call. The ESC Pathfinder continues to be an open call in the sense that there is no predefined uh, topic, so you can actually bring your own project your own idea doesn't have to be uh, yeah, circumscribed to any particular domain although it's true that we have and I will explain that more yeah, uh, later on we have already also targeted calls that they are like tackling uh, specific uh, challenges uh, and, and, and uh, domains and as you can see there it's uh, like the proposal is a 15 page document 
the grant that you can receive if you are uh, successfully uh, granted a grant, it's uh, uh, up to 3 million euro. And for uh, to have this project in place and, and receiving money from the EU, you need to have a consortium of minimum of three partners from three different uh, European Union member state countries or associated countries. For instance, if you have, let's say, a Moldovan uh, researcher that partners with the University of, let's assume, uh, Brasov, and then a company in Germany that will perfectly work and qualify for funding for the Pathfinder. And this is actually what we want to do also. We want to foster those connections across European nations. Um, this is like actually uh, it's about what I mentioned about the thematic calls. So I said that uh, in principle the Pathfinder is an open call with no predefined topics. But we also have specific thematic calls that you can see there. So this year, 2019, we launched three. That was in March. Uh, and uh, uh, they tackle three, I think, important uh, uh, areas. One is the AI, human-centric AI. The other one is implantable autonomous devices and materials, which has many, many different applications, particularly on the health sector, health domain. And also, really important, especially now in the context of the new commission uh, taking place, uh, is the breakthrough zero emissions energy generation for full decarbonization. This is, of course, l uh, linked to the actual Green Deal discussions that uh, they are being held in Brussels and the other parliament with establishment of the new commission. So these are these are really relevant. And these three calls in total, it's about 50, uh, so it's a budget of 52 million euro in grants. And for next year, we will launch another three. One is called Future Technologies for Social Experience. Here you can imagine that it's mostly related to IT applied to the yeah, social networks domain. So for instance, think about uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, and so on. We also have one on nanometrology, so this is a nanotech. And one on digital twins for life sciences. This is about uh, using uh, IT for uh, the uh, life sciences domain. So, uh, you, you know, do simulations and so on. And for those three calls, we have a budget, or we will have a budget next year of, for, of uh, around 50 million euro. And uh, for these specific thematic calls, these, the grants, they are up to four to five million euros, and they last for three, for four years, sorry. And again, as with the open calls, it's three partners from three different European Union member states or associated countries. Uh, just a note on the associated countries, uh, Moldova is an associated country, but you also have Ukraine, you also have uh, Israel, you also have Norway. So you have many other countries that they are not part of the 28 European Union member states, but they participate to our program and they can benefit from there, from that. So again, like there is no limitation to have a collaboration with, uh, yeah, with an Israeli company or research in uh, institute, uh, a company, uh, company from Spain and maybe a big uh, yeah, or yeah, medium-sized corporate from Germany. In fact, I can tell you that in last June there was an event in Bucharest, um, which is, by the way, the, uh, we will repeat in Croatia in April 2020, so I invite you to go there. It will be in Dubrovnik, so it's a really nice location. Um, and basically there I met a project a manager who is doing something really, I will say, yeah, revolutionary, and this is the aim of the Pathfinder, which is the following. These guys, they're actually developing uh, like technology to send a rocket into space and this rocket will have a sort of a like tethering device to try to gather um, how it's called, uh, yeah, space junk to clear that. So this is something that's on science fiction but it's happening now and it's happening with European Union money so with the money of the Pathfinder and basically that, that, that particular project was like researchers from universities in Italy and Spain with a German company, another company from Italy, and 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 you see, I mean you can really see there the interdisciplinarity, research plus business, and also the different countries, Italy, Spain, and Germany. This, I mean, this is actually the clearest example of what we are trying to do, trying to build something revolutionary, uh, new ideas. They're pretty wild, but they can make. I mean, they can be real. They can become a, a reality with many different people, brilliant people, with a vision, with a, you know, a willingness to change the world in many different places yeah, across Europe. Um, next slide. And then we also have a thing called the Innovation Launchpad, which is basically um, one instrument that is designed to be used for uh, taking the uh, results from Fed projects. So you know, uh, the, yeah, uh, let's say that one Fed project develops one certain innovation, and they want to bring this innovation to the market and they want to explore it. But these people, let's say they are researchers, 
and perhaps they don't have a business idea. I mean, they don't know how to put together a business model and you know and develop a business plan to make this idea go to the market and you know and generate revenue and profits and also let's say uh, licensing patents and so on. So this innovation launchpad is an instrument designed for that to support these people that have uh, results, that they have uh, ideas, that they are a reality. And give them the you know the chances the you know the money to develop those business plan, register those patents, and also launch perhaps a spin-off, maybe create a, like a, a SME, a small medium enterprise. I mean, you can imagine. It's true that it's a really bit limited amount of money you compare it with the grants uh, for the for the yeah for the Fed part for the for the Pathfinder uh, as such. Which it's only 100,000 euro, but indeed it's not. We are here. We are looking at let's say research. We are not looking at research and developing technologies. The technology is already there. We just want to bring that technology closer to the market. So with 100,000, you can for sure uh, do something about patents. You can do something about business plans and so on. Uh, next slide. And this is the other part as well, uh, the transition to innovation activities. It's something similar to the innovation launchpad, but it's more concrete in the sense that this is for, let's say, more established um, uh, projects that they already have results, they already have a business plan. The only thing is that they need to, let's say, increment uh, the velocity at which they deploy uh, this technology, this new innovation. And also, uh, let's say, also, um, it, it actually focuses more on the commercialization and the, uh, and the deployment of technology to the market, not only on business plans and so on, and uh, patents and uh, so patents licensing and so on. As you can see, it says at the end of the typical Fed Open and Fed Proactive project. So it's just you get, a, let's imagine the situation where you get a grant from the Pathfinder Fed uh, Open part. You get three million. Let's say you develop, the, you know the. Yeah, technology, the project, you end uh, with the final reporting period, which is when you have to present what you have developed with the money, and you have a technology. You have maybe your patents ready, uh, registered, and so on, but you want to uh, become, let's say, uh, yeah, company, a spin-off, and put that, uh, that innovation to the market. This is what you need. This is the transition to innovation activities. It's a scope. And it's, uh, it's a, uh, so the normal, let's say, you, you get money uh, from, from this uh, specific scheme, it will last for two years, and you get between one and two million euros, which is significant. And sorry, can you go back again? Um, go back again. Yeah. Uh, no back. Yeah, and as you can see uh, here, we also for the transition innovation activities, we also targeting specific domains: micro and nanotechnologies, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, um, also healthcare, uh, energy. That's also quite important. Will become more important in the future, I'm, I, I can say already, and and so on. And if if uh, I can say something about this is that as opposed to the Fed, uh, let's say uh, part, so the ESC Pathfinder Fed grants, where you need to have a consortium of three. Uh, uh, people, I mean minimum three to five people from three different countries. Here you can be a single, let's say, researcher at the University of I know, Chisinau, and you want to, I mean, you have already your, let's say, your idea, your business plan is one, you can apply as, as an individual. So that's also a one, one difference. Uh, next slide. Um, and these are the uh, next cutoffs for the Pathfinder. The Fed open part, there's a cutoff date on 13th of May next year. Fed Proactive does the thematical I mentioned before with uh, specific um, uh, topics. Uh, 22nd of April 2020. Uh, Fed Proactive Environmental Intelligence, which is something I didn't explain, but I can explain briefly now. This is a specific call uh, dealing with sensors. So it's mostly on the uh, domain of sensor technology and so on. Uh, this is something new that we will launch next year. So you can have the look at the website. Um, you can see the link later at the end of the presentation. Uh, there will be a, a cutoff date on the 22nd of April 2020 as well. And for the innovation launchpad, uh, 14th October next year. So for that, you will have to wait still a bit. Um, and yet, uh, that's it. And in terms of evaluation, which is quite important if you are considering applying, uh, I will say the evaluation process is pretty transparent. It's quite transparent. Uh, there is no hidden traps or anything. 
if you just go with your idea, if you think it's good, you just come to us and say, hey, I have, I have this idea, I want to make this a reality. And you will actually submit the proposal, there will be an evaluation, an evaluation and the actual award of the grant will be based on three award criteria. Uh, one is the excellence, that's the actual idea, the excellence of the idea, the, the essence of the idea, which is 60% of the value. 20% is for the impact, which means that what the value has for society as a whole. And the other 20% is for so-called quality and efficiency of implementation, which is basically the methodology. And uh, for the uh, transition to innovation and innovation launchpad, the work criteria, they are the same. The only thing that changes is the actual grading, the, you know, the values assigned uh, as per each category. And the time to inform, meaning the time uh, that actually uh, lapses between the submission proposal and and let's say when you know that uh, you have been uh, uh, selected is five months and the time uh, to grant which is the time that takes from submission proposal to the actual res uh, reception of the money of the grant is eight months about the grant I may say as well that we uh, so far I think under f the current pilot we are only reimbursing 70% of the grant of the, yeah, of the cost so uh, it's only 70% but in the future with a new uh, post uh, horizon 20 uh, uh, sorry horizon Europe uh, regulation, we will aim for 100% reimbursement of cost. So this is also quite relevant. And just to finalize, I give you one example of one company, or one project that we funded. Uh, you can see there, uh, like a quotation from the from the CEO uh, of this company. But you can see there, highlighted in uh, orange, is that the basic features of the Pathfinder as a funding instrument is that we are supporting uh, uh, yeah, innovators. We are uh, let's say, trying to uh, fund a breakthrough disruptive innovation that creates new markets, that uh, solves new, uh, like, new unsolved problems. Uh, you can think about climate change mitigation, you can think about uh, different health uh, diseases and so on. So we are trying to, uh, let's say, fund those projects that they can tackle those issues. And you can see in this case, this company, it's, so it's, I think it's about uh, uh, one implantable device that you can put in your body, and that's, that device actually is for testing drugs. So. There's also a social or moral dimension here with this project. Is like you don't have any mal testing anymore if you get those, you know, those devices ready and you know, and for mass deployment. So you're not only improving the state of technology, the state of the art of technology, but also uh, addressing a social issue. So developing drugs faster and more safely and more tailored to the patient's needs. But also you're ending animal testing. I'm a yeah, I'm a fan of animals, so I'm really happy with this. I hope you are as well. So this is again the type of project that we are trying to fund. Uh, we have many more examples that we, yeah, we can give you. I can talk about rockets, I can talk about uh, batteries, uh, also about some sort of scanners for, for, for detecting cancer disease. Anyway, we have plenty of projects. And I think this is the number of presentation. Maybe you can move one more. And now it's the accelerator, so it's my colleague Cornelius again. Thank you very much. Also, Mesk. Yeah, so the marathon of the presentation continues, but no worries, this is um, the last part, and then it'll be up to you also to um, ask questions. So this is the accelerator in two bullets, basically provides innovators and innovative companies with blended finance grants, um, this um, combination of grant and equity of up to a total of 17.5 million, and it's supposed to bridge the finance gap between the late stage innovation activities and the market um, take up when these activities become profitable. The next slide also tries to give you um, on one slide the essentials of, of this pilot. It is, remains very selective. It is open to small and medium enterprises and startups anywhere in Europe in any field at any time. It is a continuously open call which just has certain deadlines during which we harvest the applications. It remains highly competitive. We are in the range of 4% success rate. We wish it would be a bit more. Um, maybe with the increased budget, um, we might have a slightly better success rate. Um, these projects are selected by leading experts, innovators and investors. It is um, very founder friendly, we believe, because it is non-dilutive grant funding uh, combined with non-intrusive equity. We want to be a patient partner in our equity. Um, it is about smart money also, meaning coaching, mentoring and business acceleration services. I come to that in a bit more detail. And 
and of course access to further finance, knowledge and commercialization partners. As mentioned before, we, our aim is not to do this alone, but very much together with the private sector, with other venture capitalists and other sources of capital. It is for disruptors with high risk, high potential innovations that can create new markets and for risk levels that are above what traditional venture capitalists and banks will usually finance. And it is um, for companies with scale-up potential, that's very important. Scalability is an important part of the evaluation for innovations that address European and global markets with the funding that we have now mentioned many times. Next slide. The grant um, is for um, um, early stage innovation for development, so that's the technological readiness level 6 to 8 that I mentioned, whereas the equity can by nature be used for anything from early stage but also mature innovation and for the scale up for the commercial activities. Um, we have um, the opportunity for the applicant to give us, if an applicant for example applies in principle only for the grant, so the possibilities that you have currently is to apply only for the grant or for the combination of grant and equity. You can currently not apply for equity only. Um, but what you can do is when you apply just for the grant, you can give consent to the jury to potentially convert part of your grant into um, equity when they see in particular that you have activities that are beyond TRL8, which by definition of our rules cannot be funded by grant, then if you have not given consent, they will simply reduce the grant by that amount. If you have given consent, then they can convert that into equity. And um, for those that have given this consent, there's also the, the possibility to obtain equity as just mentioned, even it was, was not requested at the moment of submission. So either in those cases where we convert act, the um, money requested for um, activities that are related to commercialization, or also if it appears during the interview that the company might have underestimated its need for capital and there might then be the need for additional equity. We now go step by step through the application. We have um, the submission of proposals. Next slide. Um, as mentioned, mentioned the continuously open calls with cutoffs. We have, of course, electronic submission through our general Horizon 2020 funding and tenders portal. We have a new single template um, for the both options, grant and blended finance, which asks some additional questions about financial elements of the company, which weren't be there before. You need to submit your pitch deck, which is the pitch deck for the interview and applicants that are positively evaluated for blended finance might then later, during the course of the due diligence, we come to that, be asked for additional information on their equity request. The next slide is again a very practical how-to slide, so this just gives you the direct link um, to the participant portal, which now is actually called Funding and Tenders Portal, um, where you can find the um, EIC Accelerator, you attach your pitch deck, you provide additional informa financial information. The next part is very, very important, um, local support is crucial. We cannot, I mean, we do this roadshow, we've done this in now, I think this is one of the last countries that we go to, which is not not at all the least countries, of course. Um, we save the best for the last. Um, but we have been um, to all these countries, but we cannot um, advise individual applicants. That is, to a large extent, the task of the national contact points, which are mentioned there. You have national contact points also here in Moldova who have access to direct information from us. So we, in we invite for certain um, events who are also supported by a support action for these national contact points. So that's a very important source of information for you. And the evaluations are evaluated approximately every three months with a break and the longer break in the summer. So the deadlines for 2020, I think we have another slide on that, are 8th of January, 18th of March, 19th of May, and 7th of October. Um, we then have next slide. Um, yeah, I think one more click. Yeah, one more. One more. Um, no, sorry, one back. Um, so following the um, submission of proposals, we then have the remote evaluation, the ranking and the interview, and we come to that in the next set of slides. Um, next slide. 
um, the um, evaluation criteria slightly different from before but on the substance I would say actually no change uh, we now have a equal weight for impact excellence and quality and efficiency of implementation but what we mean here by excellence for example is very different from what we mean in the pathfinder that Andres has presented so whereas in the pathfinder it is a very big emphasis is on the breakthrough nature of the technological idea. Here the excellence lies also in the business plan, in the market marketability and in the correct assessment of the market opportunity. That's the excellence um, here. Similarly, the impact and the implementation are adapted to this particular instrument, which is a very much a close to market in instrument. If the company has requested and been successfully um, awarded with an equity component, then they will have additional um, due diligence. The time to inform is even shorter because we're dealing here with small and medium enterprises in a very dynamic environment um, who need fast decisions and fast money. Um, we actually have four months from the um, submission date or from the cutoff to the time that we inform companies and we have the um, we sign almost or actually over 90% of grants are signed within six months from the date of the application. The equity part will take a bit longer, so we're doing this for the first time. We're just starting this process now, um, but we expect that it will be one or two months after the evaluation system that a separate equity agreement will be concluded, and I have more details on that. The next um, slide gives you the um, evaluation process. Um, as mentioned, experts in technology, business, and finance. We do not have for this instrument pure academics here. We have people who know the technology but who also know the business environment um, very well. We have a remote evaluation. All applications are first remotely evaluated and the best that come out from the remote evaluation are then invited to a face-to-face -face interview in Brussels at a ratio of between two to three times the budget that we have available. So once you are in the interview, your success rate is about one to two or one to three. As I mentioned, three possible outcomes. Go, yes, you get the money that you requested for. No, unfortunately, you're not on our final list. Or the decision, yes, you get some part of your money as grant, but we have also converted part of your money into um, equity. That's the change into blended finance decision. Next slide. Um, yes, one more, I think. One more because this gives you now, this now goes into the due diligence and the equity agreement, the next part. Next slide. Um, this is obviously only applies to those projects who are requesting the blended finance. It will be done by a so-called EIC fund, a new legal entity that we are funding um, under Luxembourgish law um, that is not yet existing, but now we are very close to the commission decision who will make this possible. We hope that this legal entity will be established in January. Um, but it's already, even though the legal entity isn't work, isn't doesn't exist yet, the people who will work in it are already working on the current um, on the um, grant on the equity from the current cutoff that we had just we had interviews only two weeks ago. So we're now starting to work on these projects as soon as they will have been informed next week. I think the goal is a tailor-made investment that fits the needs of the company and of the project. The due diligence will, in principle, not put into question the decision of the jury to award the equity, but it will go into more details in terms of confirming what is the right amount. The amount that the jury sets is usually the maximum amount, but the due diligence process might find that actually a little bit less is needed only. And then a very important, the structure of the equity, is this, um, are these convertible loans, is this direct equity, what are the tranches that comes, so this is the next two bullet points, that the estimation of the total effort and the defin definition of the tranches and key milestones that need to be achieved in order to release these tranches. And um, of course, during this whole due diligence process, there will be additional questions to the um, companies. Next slide. 
we do matchmaking with co-investors. I have mentioned that we want to crowd in investors. Um, we use a community of trusted venture capitalists and investors that is already existing with the European Investment Bank. We are working with them. So as mentioned, this EIC fund will be a new legal entity. Um, the European Investment Bank will help us setting up this entity, will also second people to work in this entity, but it remains the European Commission that is is responsible for the board of directors. It is um, commission, um, employee, commission employees who will form the board of directors and will make the final decision. Um, possibly complemented by some, or clearly complemented by external expertise. We will have an investment committee which we will appoint. Those will be experienced investors um, from outside the commission. The companies will be presented with venture capitalists that express the interest to invest, but the company will have the final say. Next slide. The equity investment will be structured via a separate agreement, which will exist linked, of course, but as a separate agreement to the grant agreement. As mentioned, the EC, the European Commission will be advised by experts but retains the last say in the investment decision. The EIC fund generally will play a passive role in the daily management of the company. Um, for um, It will start to look early on, of course, for an exit strategy. It is a patient investor, but we also want for these companies to grow and to go the next step. So um, exit routes will set um, by different cases. Um, ideally, the company will reach growth, maturity, and will be attractive to additional investors. The next slide, I think, shows again the timeline for this. Um, so, um, as mentioned, um, the grant agreement um, is a total of four months from the submission of the proposal. So you have the submission of the proposal, then you have about six weeks um, from um, for the time to, in, um, to inform about the result of the remote evaluation, then you have the interviews, then you have two um, months for the grant signature, um, and then comes the additional, now here they are talking about six months, before it was one month, I think the reality will hopefully be somewhere in the middle, um, that we hope for, oh no, sorry, the six months, I think this is always the total timeline, I guess. I'm a bit confused now myself by the slide, but so the, um, what remains is that the grant agreement will usually be signed within um, four months, uh, within six months after the um, deadline, and then we will need a bit of additional time, one to two months, for the due diligence until the equity investment can be um, signed. Next slide. Um, this is another slide that um, tells us a bit about the activities of this um, EIC fund, um, which, as we said, will to a large extent be staffed by the European Investment Bank Group. So they will do market testing and look for co-investment with existing or known future equity investors, which they will be contacted directly based on the needs of the companies and the group's proprietary knowledge of the EU ecosystem. Um, European investment funds, venture capitalists, and the European investment banks, corporate and NPB stands for National Promotional Banks Networks. They will set up a digital portal for this connection. They have connections to more than 200 European venture capitalists, to corporate venture capitalists, to the national promotional banks, um, and of course also to non-EU investors, to private family offices, foundations, etc and or alternatively or in, in conjunction with this, they will also do directly the investment with the, the own money of the fund through the equity or the convertible instrument, determine the most appropriate funding structure, um, uh, the capital structure, the economic alignment of interest, and the funding structure to accommodate future equity rounds. Next slide um, is on something very important. We only have one slide here, but one could certainly talk much more about this. Um, the EIC is not only about money, it is about smart money. So we do have uh, what we believe are excellent business acceleration services, which are now offered to all small and medium enterprises in the um, European Innovation Council. Um, in the accelerator, this already has a tradition. What is new is that we're now offering these services also to the small and medium enterprises and to individuals who have the intention to set up an enterprise in the Pathfinder service. It's 
ends exactly with the goal to facilitate this transition from ideas to commercialization. We have coaching of up to 12 days. We have mentoring um, for individual founders, CEOs, and leaders. We have an online community platform, and we have very important networking events, such as corporate days where we organize um, where we start with the matchmaking, where we approach large companies such as Philips or um, Roche in the pharmaceutical sector or a big bank. We recently had a very important event with the OTP Bank in Hungary who are interested in um, some of our companies. We send them our portfolio. They look through it. They say, we are interested in these and these and these companies. We then check with the companies. Are you interested in a networking event with this um, a large corporation? And if they say yes, Yes, we organize a day. We had this day in um, Budapest now with, I think, 12 companies from our portfolio and OTP. And we have a very high success rate in follow-up deals between these corporations and our SMEs because of this handmade um, selection um, services. Um, we are also now starting a new activity to look into a public procurement as a source of business for our companies. So we're trying to um, train them in how to apply, to apply to public or private procurement activities because, as you know, procurement actually represents a huge amount of business of GDP and we want to make this more accessible to our companies also as a source of income. Um, I also have in the next slide um, one success story story here, Vario Technologies in Finland, which was funded just last year in January um, with um, the EIC Accelerator, and then already in October was able to attract 27.3 .7, million in a Series B, is now collaborating with a number of um, companies in the mobility sector. Um, so this is, of course, um, with a view to self-driving cars. Very impressive. I've seen a demonstration of what this company does. It's very impressive. Next slide. Um, one instrument that we still have in 2020 is the so-called Fast Track to Innovation instrument. This is also for fast go-to-market for an industry-driven innovative concept to grow and scale up. It is grant only. It's bottom-up. No, uh, no, no themes. We have consortia between three and five. Similar condition as mentioned by Andres in the Pathfinder. Minimum of three companies from three EU, com EU member states or associated countries like Moldova. Um, it has mandatory industry involvement. It grants up to 3 million, and we still have um, three cutoffs in 2020 in February, June, and October. And the next slide also gives you an example um, for such an EIC pilot, um, FTI, Fast Track to Innovation case, a biodegradable water reservoir for landscape scale ecosystem restoration, which in this case was also able to attract um, or one of the company, one of the small and medium enterprise that was um, leading this consortium was able to attract um, a Series A financing um, a year after they were financed by us. And I think the number of collaborations is wrong there that is copied from the previous slide. So in any case, we are now already at the EIC prices. Uh, so this is a different way of funding. Here we don't um, give our funding in order to reach a goal. Here we give our funding once the, ro the goal has been achieved. So we have a deadline where the solution needs to be ready. Um, the idea is to address difficult societal or technological challenges through game-changing innovation to accelerate the development of effective solutions and um, to apply out-of-the-box innovative thinking and to open participation across sectors and disciplines. The next slide gives you the list of these um, um, prices. It includes the low-cost space launch that we had already, already mentioned and the artificial photosynthesis. You see the different deadlines. Um, so this is a different way of funding with an inducement price. And then I think we come already to the last slides with links um, for help. Um, we have, of course, a website. We have a pilot guide for applicants. We have important um, frequently asked questions. The national contact points are mentioned here again. And a different European program, the Enterprise Europe Network, also offers um, important information on this program. Thank you very much. I think um, we're very curious now about um, the questions um, at the panel and then also your questions. Thank you very much.
find and I couldn't find any information how to guide through to in, in order to register without any support or any any help. Yeah, uh, normally all the information is on the website. So I mean, uh, we are fully transparent with that. You can see all the requirements for the you know for the call there. You can see all the conditions that apply, all the steps. So and indeed, I mean, you need to register through a portal. I think that's the way it works. So there's a participants portal, or which is the tender and fund uh, no tenders and funding website of the commission. So there you can see the so the entire listing of open calls, and you need to be registered in the portal. Indeed, you need to put your uh, information and so on. And and, uh, and then you can apply through that portal. So I mean, I don't know what, what practical uh, problems you had. You know, as an individual, not another company. Or as not only, but as an individual, yeah. you can do it. I mean, you. I mean, let's imagine that you're a researcher. Maybe you are, and you work at university. That's fine. I mean, you can get funding. Let's say. And if you just represent an individual without any uh, university research or um, anything, if just um, um, let's say an individual. But you need, of course, to, uh, to be part of a consortium. Yeah. So for these um, kind of calls you need partners. So there's also in the funding and tenders um, portal a partner search tool. Um, this is of course crucial and of course I will also, I think we can admit that the, the partner search tool is an important tool that we have but you need to know people in the field as since you, they need to be from three different member states you need to find partners that build a, um, a convincing consortium and, and I will also say that individuals, natural person are a tiny minority of applicants. Most people do apply from a legal entity like a university, a research institute, a company, or a small and medium enterprises. Theoretically, you can be an individual, but that is very rare because you need the resources, you need the operational capacity, you need the... Um, the, the um, I do behind. agree, but I've got a, um, a, an individual case. For example, a person who works in an industry for, let's say, 20 years has never been involved in a master degree or PhD degree, nothing. He sees the solution, he finds the answer, and he wants to apply for a fed open because he, he knows how to solve the problem because many times between the individual um, the approach from the universities when they come for example you have an, an answer you have a solution and um, if you don't go through all the stages breakthrough are you a master are you a PhD degree you, you are rejected straight away and this is a personal experience so in order to when he said that sometimes it's just uh, not very rare but it happens um, how does that individual can get to that finding. But I, I think that I mean you need to you need for these schemes for the Pathfinder schemes that I think are the ones that you're talking about because you're not yet at the stage where you are like one or two years from the market because then you can set up your startup and then you are eligible for the single uh, for the single company support but for these earlier stage Pathfinder projects you need a consortium so you need three uh, two other institutions or theoretically individuals but it really this is I mean you need also the capacity to administer a grant. You need to have laboratories at this stage. So it's rare that you have those yourself in your basement. That's why I'm a little bit cautious about the individual company. Uh, I, I do agree, and um, I think I have to start a bit more to give you um, a call, um, to, to, to ask you a proper question. Um, because more, I'll talk a bit later. We can also have maybe in the break time to discuss this um, individually if there are other questions. I don't know also how you want to, I mean, I'm happy to take a few more questions now. Yeah, and then we have a break and then we have the panel. So I'm happy to take a few more questions. Thank you. Sorry, there's one thing that I wanted to add because I've said it twice, but of course also in terms of finding the right, um, I mean, being able to apply, yes, absolutely, the website is there, transparency, all the information is there, but do go to your national contact point. I mean, they are the ones who have seen other applications who um, can give you tips um, that you might not think of. Hi. Uh, Vadim Yatskevich, National Agency for uh, Research and Development. Uh, you talk about uh, involvement of uh, different experts, technological, uh, finance, business experts. Uh, how many experts do you usually involve for one proposal? 
So this differs on the scheme. I can tell you that for the accelerator in the remote evaluation, we have at least four experts. Um, um, in the jury interview, we currently have six jury members that then look at each project. So those are the numbers for the accelerator. Not sure if we know the numbers for the, for the pathfinder. The legal minimum, I think, is three, but you will in most cases have more evaluators that look at one given proposal. Yeah, I mean, so on the uh, yeah on the point of uh, the uh, yeah evaluation proposals, normally what we try to do is just to have uh, like a panel of uh, evaluators that they come from different uh, parts of the uh, domain, you know, of the technological domain, so they can look at the proposal with fresh eyes. So it's not that we have one person that knows about one tiny part of the market segment of the market or se segment of the innovation process. So we are trying to do that. I mean, I know how the evaluator works, uh, how the um, accelerator works. Uh, in terms of uh, yeah, the evaluation, because I've been there at the jury uh, members' evaluation, and it's yeah quite dynamic, I will say. So you have people from business, people that are investors, people that are more uh, yeah technology experts, plus also people that are business experts. So uh, that's it uh, for the third. Since we are aiming at let's say only the advanced research, I will say that the evaluators are mostly researchers, but they come from different domains, that's for sure. Thank you. And um, uh, I, regarding the criteria for each call, um, is uh, each expert evaluating um, according to the established criteria? So I mean, even if it's technical or business or uh, financial, so all of them are evaluating the proposal according to the unique criteria. Yes. Yes, correct. So we have, I only gave you the big headlines of, the, so the three criteria, which are actually, the headlines are the same, excellence, impact, and implementation. You have for each scheme, then under each of these headlines, sub-criteria. So for example, it tells you what to look at under implementation. For example, the team, the composition, the complementary of the team. So you have a number of sub-criteria, which are also published. And we brief our experts. And when we see that in the, so to some extent, we see that when they are sitting around the table, if for the jury interview, um, but also for the remote interview when we read their um, evaluations, we have a quality control where we go back and say, look, you actually should evaluate according to these criteria. So yes, we brief um, experts, we have moderators who recall the criteria. So yes, everybody is called to evaluate according to these criteria. That doesn't, of course, exclude that people still have, obviously they have different interpretations, different ideas about what that means, but there is a common basis. Um, um, that is the published evaluation criteria. Was that answer to you? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Vitaly Morar. I'm the national contact point for SAMEs in Horizon 2020. I have a question uh, regarding the uh, EAC pilot accelerator. Let's say that if a company is, uh, is winning this uh, scheme, yeah? So he's eligible for the grant part. But he wants to start the equity process, and according to the equity, you need to start due diligence. Yes. If in this due diligence process, this company, I do not know, somehow is they discover something which is not uh, possible for this company to receive this equity, do you refuse the grant too, or yes? <laughs> just my, my nodding was just acknowledging the question. Very important question that we get a lot and where the answer is unfortunately not no or yes because both things can happen. So there are different scenarios. If we discover during the due diligence that there is something wrong with the legal base of the company, that there is fraud, something then obviously we will not give a grant. So then the grant um, will not be given. Um, Another case is if we discover that the company or if the due diligence process um, sees that this company is for some other reason not really ripe to get this investment, then it depends whether the grant alone still makes sense. So we can imagine a case where we see the jury is just, the, it's too early to start the commercialization activities that you have planned. If this comes out in more detail, I mean, the, normally the 
jury should also try to assess this, but they might not have the time in the one hour, 20 minutes that is currently the jury interview and the assessment of the jury. Um, so then, um, then it might very well be a case where you say, great, we give you a grant, you get two more years, and then you might be ripe for equity um, investment. That might be a perfect case. If, on the other hand, um, the grant depends on a concurrent investment of substantial equity, and that is not available or doesn't happen, then that might be also an opportunity, then the grant alone doesn't make sense. So it depends on whether the grant alone makes sense in the absence of the equity. Yeah, yeah. So we imagine that um, yeah, it's, it's too early to speculate on how often this will happen. We hope, of course, that this will not happen a lot, um, these cases, uh, but both options are possible. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and for the questions also. Now I think we can have a comfort break for 20 minutes, and then come back and go on. Welcome at the next, the second and the last session. Uh, of course, we we need to localize the information that we hear uh, today to look also on our ecosystem, on the possibilities to, to take full advantage uh, of the opportunities which are uh, offered by the European Innovation Council. Uh, as it was already mentioned, we are an associated country to Horizon 20, 2020 uh, program, so we have the same rights as our colleagues from the EU member states and other associated countries. I really hope that um, we will become also associated to the new Horizon Europe um, project uh, program. I saw that the figures for, for EAC are quite ambitious, 10 billion uh, for the next uh, programming period. So we need to get ready. As the Chinese are saying, when is the, the, the best uh, time to plant uh, a tree? Yesterday, the second best time is today, so we need to, let's say, to push uh, harder in order to create the capabilities here in the Republic of Moldova to disseminate the information among the community, not also uh, R&D community, which is, I think, aware of the opportunities offered, offered by the Horizon 2020 and further Horizon Europe program, but also to a wider community of SMEs, uh, startups, uh, and uh, uh, young entrepreneurs. So today we will have have a um, small panel where we will try also to, to see which is the situation here in the country uh, with the um, entrepreneurial ecosystem or startup ecosystem, how we can better use the opportunities offered by uh, European Innovation Council, current opportunities and the future one to get, to get prepared, and uh, what uh, it is already done by the national contact points, the national contact points uh, network uh, in order to assist to help, to advise uh, SMEs uh, in, uh, assessing, in, uh, in accessing um, EU grants and the other forms of uh, other types of funding. So we will have in the panel today Cornelius Schmaltz that you already heard in the morning from the uh, YASME, yes, Executive Agency for Small and Medium Sized Enterprises. I think that Andres will also intervene if there will be some questions related to, um, to his part. Um, Donna Schola representing Academy of Information Technologies, DNT, also Generator Hub. You, you, I think that uh, some of you may know uh, Donna as a policymaker, but also as a facilitator and a uh, uh, person who is uh, keen to develop the startup ecosystem in Moldova. Uh, Anna Kirica, Director of Strategic Project, Association of Information Communication Technologies Companies, ATIC, yes, and also uh, TechWheel Project Manager, a very interesting and dynamic initiative in Moldova. Uh, Mr. Vitaly Moraru, National Contact Point for Small and Medium Enterprises. Uh, he will be your gateway for assessing further the information about EAC calls for uh, um, getting assistance in applying, uh, identifying uh, uh, consortia, and so on and so far. So my first um, questions, I think, question uh, go to, uh, to uh, Donna. I, we discussed a little bit um, uh, during the coffee, during the, the, the break. Uh, about the relevance, or I, I don't know, how, how the offer presented today by, uh, by the EIC, the opportunities presented by um, uh, colleagues from the EIC corresponds or are relevant to the needs of, the, of our startup community or, or our SMEs here in Moldova, taking into, into, into consideration your experience up to now. Thank you very much. I'm 
happy to to be here and to to hopefully contribute <laughs> to the SMEs development. Uh, the instruments in general are very very relevant for the, the for the SMEs uh, needs in Europe, of course. But in in Moldova, we have some specifics, and these specifics are related first of all uh, to their. Um, relative uh, small community of uh, entrepreneurship, innovative entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, and uh, uh, we need to increase first the quantity of the people involved in the innovation uh, generation ideas and, uh, and uh, connect, uh, con connect sectorial entrepreneurship with uh, technologists and uh, researchers. Uh, here we definitely we have the room to to improvement uh, among uh, the ecosystem development there are the, there are some good uh, good progress uh, during last five five years uh, that the, the infrastructure is uh, present it's not uh, it's not yet uh, enough regionalized it's pretty much concentrated in the in the capital we definitely need to go out to work to their uh, regional uh, regional talent and then regional uh, infrastructure and uh, this will uh, definitely increase the capacity of the ecosystem to generate feasible ideas um, as well i would see the need to increase the quality of the local uh, capacity in mentors because mentorship is very important and it was of course uh, mentioned in your presentation that uh, assistance uh, to, to mentorship is uh, is one of the keys and yes here we uh, we think uh, with colleagues from the ecosystem, we think how to uh, how to increase local capacity of mentors, but also to connect to the international pool of mentors, uh, and uh, this uh, this will um, will help us to tackle another another uh, specific, which is related to the closeness of the uh, of the society as a whole. We on the level of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, pretty much need the connections with the similar uh, companies outside of, uh, of Moldova. We need to uh, to bring more uh, more talent and more people who are ready uh, to generate ideas from other um, um, other behaviors and other the diversity would be important to increase the diversity of the teams and diversity of their. Uh, no, no, of their uh, community uh, and uh, unfortunately another uh, another factor which is important and this is the country kind of, kind of the country risk maybe can be associated with that a couple of uh, of recent um, startups uh, who were uh, created in uh, in Moldova when they get into the accelerator and later on and like European even a European accelerator or uh, sometimes American accelerator then uh, the resulting of the acceleration program they've got access to to some uh, some venture capital or some equity investments they change their jur jurisdiction of course, because Moldova is not the country uh, which is uh, suitable f now, at least for their, um, for such an investment. So we will uh, not be uh, not be present uh, if we will not work uh, with this uh, uh, with with the systems and uh, with, with their uh, with the trust of uh, of their institutions. Uh, we will not be able to. To put us on the on the map of the uh, of the future of development of uh, of the SMEs and innovation in Europe. So this is very briefly. Thank you. I was uh, looking about on some data from the State of European Tech Report. Uh, for 2017, I think, yeah? so two-thirds two of investments in Europe were done by investors within the same country. Yeah? So uh, uh, just, I'm passing the question now to, to Cornelius. Maybe uh, is also one of the challenges that EIC will try to tackle. Uh, just, just, sorry? Uh, the EIC will try to, uh, to tackle by uh, 
let's say, o o uh, overriding this kind of fragmentation that still exists. As you mentioned, we have the single market with the uh, rules which are all for the, uh, the same for the member states, and we have this kind of fragmentations on the innovation market. So people are uh, finding invest investors from uh, from the same country, are relying on them. Also, um, there is a study done by GRC on the beneficiaries of the Startup Europe scheme, which was uh, implemented or is still implemented by DigiConnect from 2014 until now, and uh, they discovered that 70. Uh, five seventy-eight percent of the founders of the new startups are thinking in terms of their own, or, the, or in terms of the boundaries of their own country. Uh, maybe we can, uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit how EAC is trying to to uh, to pass through this overlocking. Senator, may, may I add something to your of course. question? So that oh, it's, it's, you it's free, you can yeah. intervene whatever you like. Uh, no, I, I believe if I add something to your question, it will allow in one package to give a more comprehensive answer. Uh, so my name is, da is uh, Daniel Funeri. I was uh, Minister of Education and Research in uh, Romania, also as member of the European Parliament. And now I'm a European Union high-level advisor here to the Ministry for Education and Research. And I I'll put things quite brutally. Um, because we kind of try to elude a reality. So uh, the reality of Moldova and of this part, and in general, uh, the geographic part that is east of Vienna, is that um, after 1990, which is already 30 years ago, the best people left. I was in the Romanian t international team for chemistry Olympiades. Uh, all my friends, minus five years plus ten years, so all that generation are now professors at Harvard, Tokyo, Max Planck Institutes, and so on. So this part of Europe got deprived of what I call the golden generation of science. This is the truth. Now, once the European framework program started to kick in, and once this part of Europe started to get finance from, that, uh, from the different framework programs, the situation got incrementally better. There started to be you know, incentives for people to remain, maybe less in Moldova, but more in new member countries. That is a reality. But um, the feeling and the reality is that in order for, for science and innovation to, Im, to improve in this part of Europe, incremental change is just not enough. So watching these brilliant schemes, which they really look great, if um, I was a researcher myself, I was a, a recipient of a Marie Curie Excellence Grant at the Technical University of Munich, I had a large research group. Um, and. At that time, if we had these schemes at that time in 2006, one of our technologies probably would have made it to the market in Europe and not in the United States by our competitors. So these schemes, from, you know, seen from the researchers, they look great. The question is their relevance to countries like Moldova, where in terms of human resources, in terms of um, uh, infrastructure capacities, we are a bit disconnected from this really great schemes and makes them very difficult to access. So I would like to make a short, so after this long introduction, and sorry to maybe um, I'm opening open doors, which I hope everybody knows about, but I can talk more freely than most people here, okay? Um, so after this long introduction, I'd like to say that I believe, and I would kind of like you to reflect on this, and maybe say a few ideas that you have, but in a longer term to reflect. I believe that first of all, there needs to be a very solid political decision at the level of Brussels. <clears throat> and to answer a very simple question, do we really want to help those countries or not? If we really want to help them, we need to tailor programs that are specifically designed for their needs. 
Because these programs, as I said, I was at a technical university in Munich, right? Nobel laureates, I was having lunch every month with Nobel laureates. Any, anybody I'd meet in the corridor was either, you know, some sort of big figure in chemistry, physics, right? Uh, when one of these guys comes to Romania or Moldova, okay, it, it's a national, uh, it, it makes the news on the TV. So these programs look great for such institution, but maybe are a bit disconnected from the realities of this part of the world. So first, political decision. Do we really want to help those guys? If we do, then design programs which are particularly targeted for them, and I, I'm going to give you one example. Um, for example, in this program, okay, um, for artificial intelligence, you don't need the same infrastructure than you need from uh, for chemistry. If you ask me to build a chemistry lab in Moldova, I would say, great, maybe I can find, I can train some people, but give me five million euros to buy an Mars, to buy this, to do this, to do this. Where do I buy liquid helium and all these things? Okay, so what I'm trying to say is uh, um, built. If, if we take the political decision to actually help these countries, then do tailor instruments that are adapted to these countries and say, for example, let's pick some fields where you can quickly catch up. Artificial intelligence is one of them. Whoever is going to ride on the back of the horse that is called artificial intelligence is going to make it big. You have all these things, for example, let's say in the, um, um, in the medical devices. And in every field, in, in every field where you need uh, big laboratories, there's also a part which has to do with artificial intelligence, with IT, with programming, that can be done in these countries. So maybe schemes that would take part of these projects specifically into these countries, so, so that to irradiate knowledge and to increase the morale of the people working over here, um, that would be very useful, again, if we take the political decision to help those countries. Uh, I'm not sure I made myself clear. I hope I did. Um, and if I did, I would be extremely happy to hear some quick reflections from you, but also maybe on a longer term uh, uh, thinking. Thank you very much. Is it my turn now? <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. Please allow me just one, li just one little word to say. Um, when I was in Romania, um, of course, I had a lot of power as Minister of Research. One of the most successful things I've did, I've done. Uh, actually, I've done two successful things. Uh, you can read Nature reported on them. Uh, one of them was to put, to have all the grants evaluated by foreign experts, because. In this part of the world, you have the small country effect. Everybody knows everybody. It's not abnormal. You know, it's a small country. It's a small community. That's how it is. And the second thing was um, to organize a yearly scientific diaspora meeting. A, it was expensive, but pay for all these guys to come into the country and establish what I called a twinning scheme. Essentially, okay, you get a big grant from Romania. You can establish a laboratory, a twin laboratory. You're a professor at Harvard, Stanford. You can establish a twin laboratory in Romania. Okay, which doesn't require more than one month presence per year. So very relaxed terms in terms of presence, administrative, and so on. And in that respect, try to bring some projects over. And a very a great example is, is a guy that, uh, who's, uh, who was involved in this year's um, uh, Medicine Nobel Prize, uh, Marcel Ivan. He, he was the guy that actually did the work that received this year's medical, uh, uh, Medicine Nobel Prize. He established a very successful lab in Romania and he's, he's professor at Indiana University now. So these kind of schemes you know, really kind of increase the morale and help a lot. Yes, so actually uh, Mr. Minister make reference to somebody from Brussels, so only yeah. you two are from <laughs> <laughs> Look, we are all from Brussels now, right? Since we have to but this is music to our ears if uh, you high-level advisor for education is speaking in such a terms and is sending, I think that the same messages you, are, you also uh, send via EU delegation to, to the colleagues from Brussels, of course, because we are yeah, going to you see Brussels. And yeah, you see Brussels is a, is is has a unfortunately has a very incorrect reputation.
because in this part of the world people are used to get instructions from some um, uh, you know, um, brain which sits, which used to sit in in other parts, uh, not in Western Europe. So, um, Brussels really wants. So, my role here is, of course, to assist and to 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 help what I can, but also to send to Brussels the correct messages. So, um, Brussels is your friend, really, and is very permeable to new ideas and to 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 new ways of trying to help. Uh, Moldova and new member countries. Okay, I'll, I'll give it a try, but I'll also be honest in saying that I'm not the, 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 the best addressee for these questions, and if you are an advisor to the EU, then I hope that you have access to more, to people with more power, more experience, and more... So um, be, a, be a psychotherapist. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's not my role either. But now, I mean, for example, if uh, Signa Razzo, our DDG, was here, I heard, six months ago, then she is somebody who is more capable of giving you the right answers. I mean, this is... I am even as you've seen, not even in one of the director generals, I'm in an, in an agency that implements a program. So that is mostly what I'm here to now. Of course, I'm also an engaged EU citizen and somebody who's convinced of the European project. And in that sense, I have some ideas. And I'll also give the, the floor to my um, even younger and maybe even better ideas and colleague who has even better ideas. Um, but um, so very, very clearly, very relevant questions that I think go through the minds of many people in Brussels who think seriously about countries that are underrepresented in our program. And as you also probably know, the landscape of what we currently call widening countries, so those countries that are underrepresented in our framework programs, is rapidly changing. And what was true, for example, in 2013 is no longer true now. Um, and we will we have countries in of those countries that exceeded in 2004 that are now in the same league as some of the um, Western countries. So it's a very diverse and changing pictures. For me, the key question that you asked, and that was also something that we discussed in the that I discussed in the in the break, and actually that came already up in some of the questions before, is who is responsible for what between Brussels and the national politicians and how are these ecosystems connected and what is the I mean I can give you I'll also say if I stay true to the level and the function in which I'm here then I'm giving you I could give you very boring and very non-committal answers and get out of that responsibility I think there's no press here that broadcasts what I say here tonight on <laughs> national television or to my director general um, but um, the the key question is, so I think one very official, very, very bureaucratic, rather stand-back standpoint is, look, we offer you programs that give you the opportunity to participate. You, as national country, are responsible for creating the ecosystem and the condition that people can apply. Everybody has the same chance to apply here, and so you do your part to create the conditions that um, put companies into a position to apply. That's not a satisfactory answer. Um, we should probably talk more about that. But that is certainly something that we cannot, I mean, we, we, I don't think we can and we don't want to compensate for everything that is not going right at the national level. Maybe to some degree we need to, but there are responsibilities to be taken at the national level. And you very clearly, if you look at one other way of, one way of looking at participation rates is looking at it in terms of representation of the proportion of the population at the EU. Another one is to look at it in relation to the experience expenditure for R&D at the national level. And if you take that, the matches are very, very nicely. The countries that invest lots into R&D are well represented in the framework program. Those that don't are to a much lesser extent. So I think you also had a visit, we talked briefly about that in 2016 of our policy support facility, which is one of the other measures that we're taking to address these, to give assistance to these national um, reform mechanisms. So. Um, on the other hand, to now go more, to, to take the other side, what do we do to specifically address, and if we, if, if we answer the question, the political question that you asked, and yes, we really do want to help these countries, then one thing 
I think that we do is that we try to assist and create the framework um, conditions and the political incentives for these countries to do the reforms that they need to do in order to be successful in our programs. You are also aware probably of the widening uh, of the of the widening part of Horizon 2020 and of the negotiations for Horizon Europe. So those are this is a part of the program that is, specific, is specifically addressed to um, um, to the widening countries to the countries that are underperforming in research. There are twinning schemes in those um, um, programs that I do not know um, well enough to, to present details here. Um, and finally, there's also the structural funds. I mean, this is also, again, this is a national responsibility. These are huge chunks of money um, that can clearly be used for research and innovation. So, to some extent, I'm putting the blame back into the national field. Um, to some extent, I can give an answer, yes, there are specific fields. I'm also presenting success stories of Eastern countries that have, with the help of these instruments, made it in advance. And to the largest part, I can only say that I also do not have the answer to yours. But, Andres, do you want to add something? Yeah, well, just one more thing. So, as you know, as uh, your colleague said, we are looking at subsidiarity. So, through the AC, can do a lot of this. Post a million, post 2021. But it's true that we need to focus on the things that we consider that they are up to our level. So, here we're also looking at the pillar three of the proposed uh, new structure of Horizon uh, uh, Europe. At pillar three, you have EAC, but you also have the EAC yeah, systems. And there we are trying to connect the national uh, and regional and local authorities as well with, with, uh, with the AC and try to work with them and try to see as well how which country does what and how to specialize. It's also a link, uh, link to the smart facility strategy that is... Which are efforts which we run here. In yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, again, like we cannot do everything with a lot of money, but we are trying to focus on disruptive innovation. How you do innovation local level and how you specialize, how you train your people, how you do your research policy, that's national, regional level even. So we, I mean, we can support, we can actually build bridges and links, but it's a responsibility that is at like a lower level, it's not a new level, we, I mean, we don't have competence in education, for instance. So this is national, regional responsibility. We can build those bridges, we can, of course, uh, I mean, try to facilitate things, and this is what we are trying to do with the, with the Pathfinder and the Accelerator and the AC in general. Try to be open. There's no pre uh, pre uh, predetermined calls in general. You have some much calls, and there you can actually uh, try to find, you know, uh, uh, what things you are good at, and then apply with that knowledge. And also, we are as I uh, actually explained to one of the members of the audience that we also trying to build those connections between countries. So I mean, uh, Moldova has many connections with Romania because of history and so on. So, for instance, like if there is a person in Tijuana that knows someone in Russia or in Asia wherever else it's in Romania, that they want to build something together, they can get uh, like a German partner or a Austrian or a Spaniard, is actually what we are trying to do, we're trying to build those connections. And this connecting the system, you saw the slide where you see different circles, it's all scattered, also virtual, uh, the uh, venture capital markets, they are not pan-European, they are national, and yeah, they, they're even foreign. That's actually the question at all, sorry. I, so, so, uh, I didn't answer so your yeah, question the, about the, 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 the yeah, investment. Um, I definitely don't want to monopolize, yet I'm very glad to talk to you. So, um, obviously, there is no question that the research schemes, the granting system, your instrument, are fantastic instruments. Okay, so um, being, I was also evaluator, I was running grants, uh, whoever says they're very bureaucratic is just lying. It's reporting is very simple. Application is very simple. Honestly, I think they're great schemes. So there's no question about them. Um, the reason why I push this to you, although you obviously are involved much more at a technical level than a political level, is that from my humble experience, when you, ha when you do have some ideas and when you keep spreading them, ideas take time to make their way up. So the more people at various levels get conscious about some issues and some solutions, the higher the probability for that idea to happen in reality uh, is. Um, so, from my experience, I would just like to add some food for thought, um, also for you, but also for our colleagues, is that um, we seem to believe that a structural change in the research ecosystem 
is going to produce a content improvement. In other words, there seems to be the philosophy that, okay, we copied the German model of the German uh, um, institutional um, um, system, we copy it in Moldova or the French or the Romanian or whatever works, and then the research is going to go better. Forgetting that Germany, France, England have hundreds of years of content before their system actually evolved. And this is a very big debate in the theory of change, uh, if you, um, Amartya Sen versus John Rawls, uh, which essentially shows that it's content that brings structures rather than the structure brings uh, content. So the idea I put on the table, again, is not, is not a question, it's not a, a solution, it's just something much more long term, but I think we have to reflect very deep on it, is that imagine, all, theoretically, just imagine all of, this, of, all of the sudden huge funding, you know, the budget for research in Moldova is about 24 million euros a year, okay, which is peanuts. Um, now, just imagine all of the sudden 10 great researchers born in Moldova that by chance just come back with funds. Now, they are going to generate much more structuring effect than the most brilliant government that you can ever imagine. So, yes, it is the responsibility of the country to put structure, to structure the system in a very transparent, in a very functional way. It is the responsibility of the country to put money, but it's not the same for a big country or for a country that, for example, has problems that this country has or that other countries have. Because when you're in government, let's face it, when you're in government and you have a hundred euros and you give a hundred euros to poor kids or you give a hundred euros to somebody who's going to tell you, okay, I'm going to participate in a great CERN experiment, right? If you're prime minister, you immediately choose where to put your money. So content, bringing structure, brings content. I think we have to go on the two fronts and that's why I keep insisting on thinking about instruments that do provide content fast specifically for these uh, countries before waiting for a structuring effect coming from the greatest uh, government ever. Yes. Um, okay, when on the R&D side, I think that we, uh, we understood, uh, at least I think 10, 10 years ago, about this uh, priority which is given for excellence. So in, in 2008, I think, with uh, uh, Mrs. Lita Romanchuk, she is now in, uh, in the room, we assisted the first meeting on associating Moldova to FP7 at that time. So we understood very soon that without doing your homework internally, without investment in enough resources, even uh, those, those uh, 2.5 or 3 percent from GDP should be very carefully prioritized and connected to your strong uh, uh, let's say strong small islands of excellence in order to create some added value uh, you can't rely only on this uh, uh, let's say collaborative spot of money which is given via framework programs in, in Brussels so this, this should be some kind of blended approach eh? you need to do your homework to invest enough to cover at least from, from those small amounts of money that you have this value chain from research to innovation and further on to, to the economy and afterwards to see how these um, funds coming from Brussels can top up or can, let's say, increase the impact of, uh, that you uh, um, initially foresee. Uh, very short question to Cornelius. Do you think that in uh, Horizon Europe uh, uh, the conditions for the associated countries will remain the same in terms of participation? I mean, uh, access to blended funded and equity and so on and so far. There will be the same conditions or is still a uh, matter of discussions? Because I, I know that the conditions yeah. for this association are not clear. If I think that this will be discussed during the next presidency. If you have yeah. some... some I, I, think, I mean, this is indeed uh, an issue for discussion to restrict certain instruments to member states only. Mm -hmm. um, I do not think that this is very... 
I, I think, yeah. I mean, this is speculation, but I think that this um, issue, um, that, that there will not be, especially I think for the eastern neighborhood countries, I do not see an intention to exclude them from, um, from schemes such as this. Okay. But we will see. Thank you very much. Now, now coming back to the real needs of our entrepreneurs, uh, I would like to give the floor to Anna to elaborate a little bit on their activities and uh, also on her opinion about the needs of our startup community in terms of like, funding, thank mentoring, and so on. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sergio. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, there have been many interesting things said here related to the, uh, and, uh, and I'd like to support uh, actually uh, our uh, Romanian counterpart, the Romanian Brussels European counterpart, to have said, uh, I'm, I'm, have I'm, here, I'm here with I'm here with my French passports. On peut parler en français si vous voulez. Officiellement, je suis français ici. Bien. Okay, so uh, it, it definitely it, it takes uh, takes several things for uh, and and you have mentioned ecosystem and then innovation and then how do all these things work? I, I would definitely like to support the idea of uh, it is uh, up to every country to actually develop its own mechanisms, strategies, and everything else. But uh, again, coming back to what has been said, uh, indeed, when we talk about innovation and stuff, we need to look at the market. Innovation for the sake of innovation uh, doesn't really happen in, in the world. And it's not about Europe, it's not about US, it's not about something else. It has to be used for something. So let's look at the Moldovan whatever it takes ecosystem uh, until now. Um, I will talk on, on behalf of the ICT sector. Basically, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, the ICT sector was so small. It was, but it was quite small and not thinking, it was mainly focused on how to outsource things. It still is, uh, and that's the um, uh, reality of uh, all the smaller countries like, uh, like Moldova and in the Eastern Europe, let's say. Um, it takes time to understand, it takes openness, first of all, to actually be open to adopt things and uh, whatever was said as Brussels is your friend, that's true. It, it's not a matter of friends or not friends, it's a matter of being open to adopt and be able to digest innovation in general. So uh, what is with the ecosystem here? Currently we have, um, so in, in terms of last 10 years probably the IT only has grown grown so much, uh, still not very big, but has grown 40 times in Moldova. Uh, is that due to innovation? Is that due to more skilled, skilled labor force? Is that due to various activities? Probably it's a blend between different initiatives and it's def it definitely is important that all stakeholders are at the same table. So basically you have the government, you have the academia, you have the private sector, you have uh, various things which meet the industry needs, but also in order to innovate, it also comes with the risks. Companies don't always innovate because they uh, feel themselves comfortable on going with uh, the existing and known model, business model. Uh, so it takes different mechanisms and funding mechanisms and educational mechanisms and training and mentorship and whatever has been mentioned here, uh, at, at least during this session, it all takes to be developed. Um, we do have the experience of developing acceleration programs, incubation programs, business support programs, mentorship programs. We have had the experience of actually creating a business angel network connected to the European business angel network, by the way. Um, it has not been too successful because entrepreneurs and angels also need education on how to invest. And then uh, whenever you try to build all these pillars, you come to the point where if you succeed, and that is a long way, it's not a one year or two year, or it's, it, it's a continuous effort, um, you have to go to the uh, find funding mechanisms and how to do that. Yeah, I see it would be an option, although I'm not sure, but maybe um, my colleague Vitaly will cover how many companies or organizations in Moldova actually apply to and succeed. Um, I would not refer to whether it's difficult or not difficult to apply. The question is, if you have a call, you have to comply. It's not a matter of complaining. If you want to be part of the call, you apply. We have the experience of working 
working with different donors. Uh, USA, Sweden, uh, Liechtenstein, your Austrians. We have a current experience of negotiating something with the European delegation. Uh, it, it, it takes time and it takes, if you want to be in that whole train, you have to comply. So it's a matter of actually putting all the things together and uh, making things happen. The things that I must, I could say on our experience when we talk about ecosystem is um, within the TechWall project, which is a joint initiative between the Association of ICT Companies and the Technical University, we have tried to merge academia with the private sector to actually cover two things. We have put three issues in front of us. That was education, because companies need more skilled labor force. It doesn't matter of which kind, basic, entry, and more advanced. If you want to do innovation, you of course need to invest a lot and invest into the more advanced profiles or skill set or you have to import them and be very uh, open to do, to do that. The second thing was developing product based companies and not actually outsourcing companies so that's, that's the balance of supporting the ones who outsource because they create a pipeline of cash in the country but you want to also develop the product de product based companies and we had 389 of teams, not companies, teams because a team might not succeed and might fail, and that's fine. Uh, and um, overall, we have trained about 43,000 people in the last four years, probably, in entrepreneurship and uh, education. So now we are actually setting different targets. We have never reached the point of R&D, just because we didn't identify that we are still, we are capable of doing that. It's not, we are not ready. We are not ready. Probably there are good people in the in the country that are ready to do that, and we are ready to partner with those who who, who can and who know how to do it. And definitely, the message is um, the ecosystem is growing and has big opportunities. Um, when we talk about the industry, we see an industry that is 317 million now dollars. We want to see it at least one billion, and that can happen only if you have innovation involved, because you don't have an elastic amount of or number of people who can grow exponentially. You have to do a more added stuff, value added stuff. So uh, basically. There are mechanisms definitely needed, but it has to be a blend of efforts between everybody on this market, but also looking into different markets because the innovation market is global. It has to be applicable in different aspects. It cannot be suitable only for Moldova because it's a market of three million people. It has to be, so whenever we talk about that or innovation as a fact, it has to be uh, applicable in other countries. And that takes also perspective of looking into other countries or more regional or global perspective. So we are on the way. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, uh, startups and, and, and uh, entrepreneurs do not need only funding. And I think this explains a little bit the figures concerning those who are opting for blended. Uh, not only grant funding in terms of uh, EAC calls. Do you have some kind of statistics? Are you following this number is growing, uh, is increasing, is uh, decreasing the number of lo those uh, opting for blended funding and not only for the grants? So we only had one call so far for this blended finance. And in that call, I now I think we had a little less than half who applied for the grant only, and then we had um, a little more than a quarter who applied for the blended finance, and then a further quarter that was grant only with consent. And that, um, but the, the the part of those that are now I'm almost um, divulging a secret here, but because we, the, the results aren't out yet, but what we can see is that in the successful companies from the interview last week, the proportion of blended finance is higher than that in the applications. So we have more success, a bit more success in the blended finance applications than in the overall um, applications. So, uh, uh, but we don't have more experience. Yet. That's our entire, I mean, we only have this one call. We now need to see, and of course, this was also a new instrument, so we presume that many people were maybe a bit conservative, don't know yet about this EIC fund doesn't exist. They still want to see the investment strategy. How does it really play out? Is this a credible partner? Um, so um, I think overall, we expect blended finance um, demand to grow to also grow over that. time. Yes, thank you. Actually, uh, I looked through your, uh, uh, I, think, I think, October report 
of the accelerator part of the EIC. So I would really advise you to look on, on, on the web page. It is a public document. So there you can see the description of the call, but also a very, very interesting uh, case studies, the companies presented. So just to, to get inspired and then maybe to look with some uh, potentials for, for collaboration. Now I will pass the floor to Vitaly. Vitaly has an SMEs and NCPs for years. He knows very well the, the, or he is following the path of those who are applying to different uh, SMEs connected, uh, connected instruments. Actually when I looked on the map with the beneficiaries of uh, EIC up to now, uh, maybe being said in a joke, we are like a sleeping giant there. So we need very quickly to transform the black uh, map into a f at least a flashing light in the coming period. So which are the challenges of, for the Moldovan companies who applied for EIC work to the SMEs instrument up to now? Well, uh, Sergio mentioned correctly that um, unfortunately we need to uh, study very uh, deeply, let's say, what are the consequences of the SME instrument phase one and phase two till now and to study uh, which has a lesson learned uh, uh, till now. And till now I want to, uh, to say that uh, the main problems of the innovative companies it's not the um, uh, the problem of uh, of applications. It is uh, the problems of uh, reapplications and the capacities of uh, our uh, innovative SMEs in order to not only to write these uh, innovative uh, applications, uh, but also to write in such a manner in order to be competitive at the European level. Unfortunately, till. Now, uh, those proposals which were applied, we got only three seal of excellences, and uh, from those three seal of excellence, I think two is from the ICT sector. Those which applied are very good proposals. They applied around, let's say, two times, in the, if I'm not wrong, and they got rejected. They, they received, actually, the, the seal of excellence, but uh, unfortunately they did not uh, receive funding. And they did not uh, reapply, unfortunately, but uh, the practice at the European level is showing that uh, you need to apply four or five times in order to, to get the funding. So the ambitions of the uh, Moldovan companies, let's say innovative companies, are at the lowest level. And this is the problem, so the, the capacities that they, they do not know how to write the competitive proposals. And the second is the, the ambition to reapply once again. Because they put an effort and they think that if they put their effort and they got rejected, they won't apply, reapply anymore. So uh, they are businessmen and they are... But I want to say that in the Republic of Moldova there, there are companies which have, really have innovation potentials. And uh, one uh, of two companies we have invited today, uh, actually with one company which uh, is focused in uh, innovation in constructions, we have applied a Horizon 2020 program before, but we were rejected in one call because actually the call was concerning the ICT in construction. And uh, this innovation, which have big potential, uh, it was focused on robotics in construction. So we got rejected because there wasn't such a call at their period of time. And Mr. Nikolai Popescu, which, uh, which is here, uh, he got upset and he did not reapply, but right now uh, I convinced him that uh, his innovation is, has a real potential and we need to focus on the new instruments which uh, are providing us by the European Commission. And hopefully uh, we will reapply and we will have at least one success story. Because uh, the success story is really important. Uh, the innovative companies which are coming to me, they keep saying one thing. Uh, if we had at least one possibility or in our country, which was financed before by uh, the SME instrument phase one or phase two, and I cannot lie to them, I am telling them the truth that till now, no, but maybe you will be the first. 
So, uh, but, but there will be from October. There is no any more fight phase one. Yes, so the prom prom yes, and the, uh, the another yeah. No, but the another problem is that if in SME phase one and phase two, uh, the main applications were focused on incremental innovation. Right now, if we are talking about deep tech, it's it's unbelievable, but our chances decrease so much, and that's why I am. Uh, Actually, I am the, uh, in the program committee and uh, I was speaking with the high-level officials uh, regarding uh, the possibility of the Republic of Moldova to be financed uh, through uh, Eastern Partnership opportunities in order to compete with uh, such countries like Armenia, Georgia, uh, Ukraine and so on. Because to compete with um, European uh, countries which have laboratories, uh, which have... Um, Let's say deep tech innovation, it's, it's, it's pretty hard. So, um, so uh, if uh, Sergio will allow me, I just want to, uh, let's say, uh, the atmosphere here to, uh, to have more, more positive in this uh, direction to present uh, a short video of uh, the um, innovation in construction of Mr. Nikolai. Uh, if you allow us. It's, it's not very long, so... Yeah, we are just going slowly to the Q&A session. I think that we can use our time to continue the discussion in a more informal way, so please have the floor. What okay. do we need to do for this? Uh, can you put it? Yeah. The new technology of a multifunctional fork, the universal mobile factory used for erection of high-quality cast-in-situ concrete construction. It simplifies your workers' efforts, saves time and money, ensures high quality and convenience in use. All the processes are automated and you don't need a tower crane. The engineering preparation of the site will be carried out for every specific structure according to climatic area, soil conditions, and location of construction site. On the already completed floor structure, the basic components of the formwork are mounted, starting with the jack frames supported by the metal linkages in which the formwork grids are then incorporated. Install the supports on which the reinforcement coupling devices are placed. After that, the rolling bridge and hydraulic equipment for self-supporting and armature attachment are mounted, followed by the reinforcing cartridges. Set up the work deck on which workers will carry out various operations. Install below it the hydraulic drive equipment of the formwork components. Assemble the modular panels for wall casting and cling them to the lower sides of the jack frames. They are fitted with fixators, telescopic beams, floor planners, door voids, glazing, and corner panels. Position the panels with a distance between them according to the wall thickness. Fasten the inner and outer corner panels. Close the door and window slots. Fix them together with tapered rods. Concrete the walls at the first level. Move the jacks located at the bottom of the jack frames also by hydraulic drive. Then 
instruments and fasten them with telescopic holes that are embedded in them. After which, unfold the telescopic ribs embedded in the beams to the adjoining beams which form the supporting frame of the floor formwork. The same principle is applied to the balcony support frame. After that, the inflatable mattresses of special burst resistant material are laid on concrete chemical agents that have very low adhesion to the hardened concrete. The flooring reinforcement and concrete is followed by the walling concrete. Once the concrete reaches the project resistance, deflate the mattresses to allow a much easier stripping of the floors, incorporating the posts into the beam. Open the door and window panels, then unlock the corner panels. After lifting three levels, the working bridge is installed for the finishing work of the facade. Right after finishing the last level of the building, the formwork is dismantled and logically to the mountain. Because of the modular structure, when dismantling, it is not necessary to use complex dismantling equipment, such as the tower crane. With this innovational type of formwork, we have the possibility to raise buildings with complex architectural shapes quickly and qualitatively. Application of proposed technology makes possible to achieve high performance of construction. It allows repeated application of formwork up to 300 times. Reduction of the formwork cost by 10%. Increase of construction productivity by 20 times. Reduction of cost by up to 30%. So this was a short presentation about this uh, idea, but we have here also an entrepreneur which uh, the questions uh, which may arise we can put it on the let's say uh, break or not break but after the after the event maybe uh, to interlink with uh, our foreign guests. But uh, we have here uh, Vitale Popa, uh, which is actually from our uh, diaspora. He put actually a questions uh, raised the question uh, previous time in the in the conference, and he has an idea which he also want to share, which consists of um, producing wine without uh, additives and without uh, chemicals, with a high level technology. He even uh, applied a patent at the European level, and right now he's waiting for uh, the result from the European Patent Office. Vitaly, you have the floor. Uh, he he yeah. actually uh, <laughs> he he actually wants to to show us the computer. Yes. Uh, just one. I'll, I'll probably have to stand there so I don't um, step with my back to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can take a mic, it will be great. Hi, um, my name is Vitali Popa. I'm uh, originally from Republic of Moldova, but I've been living um, for the last uh, 13 years abroad in Australia, New Zealand. And I've just returned recently to Moldova to test the new technology that I invented to, in order to produce additive and, and preservative-free wines, which are um, very important in the market, global market right now, but no one has got a, a controlled technological flow that allows you to, to obtain these um, new wines. And, and actually, they're very healthy, and they, they have a, a very high level of... Um, um, health benefits uh, by consuming them. So, um, fortunately, I was um, able to travel abroad to different countries, winemaking countries, to see uh, different technologies and, and um, different techniques that are used in the world in order to obtain better, better quality wines. But um, so far, from my personal experience, I couldn't find um, any radical inventions that will allow you to have a controlled technological process of obtaining this product. And um, most of the companies uh, are very rich companies and they can allow themselves to, to buy this um, very expensive equipment which uh, Moldova, I don't think, is only a few players in the market that can afford this technology. And um, in, um, I started the, um, the innovative part with an idea and then obviously I didn't get any funding because um, if it's a radical idea, um, from my experience, you may get a, a very radical rejection as well, because this is a normal, normal process. But I carried on and I, um, I spent my time and funding and um, did my own research and investment. And I came up with an equipment 
which was designed in Australia and um, Australia and New Zealand and it was tested in Australia and this year I tested it in, in Moldova. Um, for everyone who is, um, likes the wines and um, I'm not a winemaker in Moldova, I don't represent any companies, I'm an individual research and um, developer let's say in it as an equipment. Um, I went to different exhibitions in water now to put this product on the market and as my colleague said right now, we have to focus first of all to encourage new new people in Moldova to come with new radical ideas or to come with any innovative ideas, um, starting with the problems from this society. And, and, and for example, in Moldova is a big uh, problem when it comes to uh, wine and viticultural sector. We are very, let's say, behind to promote our products in, into other markets because we literally, we, we very, very, very few times we, we can bring something to impress uh, um, other countries. And, and a good example, by, by using this new technology that I invented in this country, we can come up with a, a new, very uh, organic and natural product that, that has got a very, let's say, 100% success in the market because everyone is, using, is, is looking for additives and preservative-free products, especially when it comes to consuming as a food. And um, this year in Moldova, I tested this uh, technology, new technology. Um, I made the wine, and I'm in the process of obtaining, on the 6th of November, um, the European uh, Union has has published my um, invention, which has got cover for Australia and European countries, and I'm waiting for their result, but um, so far I don't, I don't have any rejection from them, and it's a new technology. I came back from Milan from last year, uh, last week, and um, the technology is not in the market. Uh, everyone is looking very strange at what I'm doing, and, and they're concerned that, that it's not working. But I'm 100% confident that it's working. I've got a product that people have tested and, and, and it's, everything is good. So my question to when it comes to um, all these um, fundings that are allowing new innovation and radical innovation, I, I, I'd like to, to take my example because I was fortunate that I had the funding and I had the, the, the support of my friends and everything to carry on. But in many cases, a, a single individual cannot represent a company and but ha can have a great idea. And, and many times he can be approached by um, universities or can be approached by other companies that can take his knowledge and convert it into someone else's patent. And I would like to address um, whether maybe in future there's going to be a policy or, or, or some regulation that will allow people to have access to the funding and if let's say in Moldova we all know that um, a lot of people have um, double citizenship which is for example Romanian passport and then in my opinion if a person from Moldova has got a Romanian passport then he is a US citizen living abroad how do we look at this situation how can he access even though it's not in Romania, how can they access the funding and having the same collaboration with the European Union? Because this is a, a matter with that has to be taken in consideration when they look at the projects and when they look at um, um, to solve. Because there, there are a lot of us, as my colleague said, there's a lot of Moldavians abroad, living abroad, smart people that may decide one day to come back. And if we create this policies and if we help them to, to, to implement these innovations, that's a, it, it's a, in the end everyone is going to benefit from, from what we're doing because at the end of the world we, we represent Europe, whether it's Eastern Europe, Western Europe, it doesn't matter, it's still Europe. And um, I, I really um, agree with and, and I'm happy that this slowly, slowly meetings are, are coming and, and people are getting used to the fact that you, you can apply, not only locally but internationally, uh, and, and I'm 100% sure that in, in the near future there will be more success stories, as Vitaly mentioned. It's something that you have to get used to. Everyone has to have the power to decide whether he wants to apply, even if it's a radical. When we say radical, of course, um, from my personal experience, and I'm saying um, people said, let's look at, at um, sustainable uh, agriculture sector. I, I was last week, I was talking to a company that got, it's an international company, I'm not going to say who, and, and um, they've got the technology to press wood and use <coughs> wood in order to make vessels. And I was thinking, <coughs> excuse me, I was thinking why not to use grape vines, because they're coming from vines, and we can use as a raw material to make the vessels. 
as a radical idea. The technology is there. We only can try it. And, and this is, can be a success. And then we're talking about 100% sustainable winemaking. Because if we use my technology and the barrels and the grapes, it's 100% sustainable winemaking. And this, this innovative part can be can generate different, <coughs> other different inventions because it may later can be applied in pharmaceutical sector. Who knows? We, 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 we don't know. What was not used 100 years ago, now it's used. Who thought that everyone is going to have a, a cell phone in their pockets and it's going to be affordable? No one thought. They said it's only high tech and all this. So I, I really encourage everyone to be, to be very, very... <laughs> Harsh. It's a harsh. It's a harsh society out there, and, and you'll be rejected many times. But do not stop. Just carry on and apply. And I'm, I know from experience that this country has got a, a very high potential when it comes to young people and, and general people that can come up with radical ideas that will help this country, and in the end, will help the whole world and Europe as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm 100% that that by by combining our force together with universities from different countries with knowledge and if we pass this between ourselves as even a word, as even an idea, we'll have success sooner or later. Thank you very much for your time. But can you show it uh, on the... Yeah. I'll, I'll just access well. quickly the, um, the, web, the web... Bring us some wine. Uh, we, we, everyone is actually... While you, while you look for that, I'll just very briefly say something. Um, when I was evaluator for some uh, projects for the European Commission, uh, there is some, um, let's say, chap there used to be a chapter there which said risks and contingencies. I mean, how do you address risk? And then I was fuming because I said, look, if under the current granting schemes, Albert Einstein would have applied and say, I want to develop the... Um, uh, relativity, relativity theory, he would have never gotten a grant. So what happened, and fortunately in your scheme, it's, it's great to see that you said high risk, um, high risk is rewarded into the uh, granting scheme that you have shown. And I think this is great because uh, uh, research is essentially the management of failure. Um, if, if, if you're a researcher that has success on a, on a daily basis, it means you're not doing something very innovative. So I think this is a great step forward to accept, to mentally accept, to, to, to take a, to depart from the bureaucratic uh, scheme where you must cover yourself in papers and you must avoid failure. No, research is about the managing of failure and I guess before you develop what you develop, before I was developing my chemistry I had hundreds of failures and my wife was getting crazy. So you have stopped doing this job because every day you come back home you're depressed because something didn't work in the lab. So uh, it's great, it's refreshing to see these uh, things. Really interesting to see uh, the representatives of the European Commission speaking about the exit strategy, equity, all these terms which are like uh, more from the business side. But but you're right. saying about Einstein, I think it will make really upset the colleagues from the European Research Council, which is uh, which are pretty sure that uh, he would pass. check check the story of <laughs> Stefan Hell, Nobel laureate in chemistry in 2015. He almost became a taxi driver before because nobody wanted to grant it his research because he's, they, they said he's, he's pushing beyond the limits of physics and he developed uh, one of the most fantastic um, um, optical microscopes which is developed in a company and it's, it's a great advance for Europe. It's two very short things. So uh, first I want to defend a little bit that form that got you fuming because yes, we absolutely want you to take risks and we want to reward high risk, but we want you to be aware of the risks. So I hope that also Albert Einstein, so that section is justified. It's just, it means if you have lots of risks, it doesn't mean that we don't take you, but we want you to know what your risks are. That's the one thing. And the other interesting thing, very much agree on the failure. We are actually now starting to look into our failure rate as an indicator of success. We need to have a decent failure rate also in the accelerator and in the in the fund otherwise we're doing something wrong and the strength and th this is well known in educational theories is that success educational success correlates much better with the capacity to learn from failure of children than with the IQ 
So the correlation of IQ to educational success, it's only 0.28, whereas the correlation of um, capacity to learn from failure is 0.78 and it's, it's the same is the same with companies you built a company it it failed but you did raise some people you 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 know in the process of failure people learn new things and how do you recover that for for success question this is only valid in Let's terms of no in terms of individuals or also in terms of bigger communities like i don't know countries regions no the study i read is in terms of individuals but but that scales at the level of the society obviously yeah, um, well, it's not a very professional web page. It's just a, a, a simple, a simple message that I'm sending to the world. So, as, a, as you can see, it's the natural beauty of smart wine making wine cider beer and spirits, which means that there's a lot of products that can benefit from from this um, invention. Um, any technology that is using um, barrels or wooden barrels for their technological process. And as if I go a bit, um, there's a story, and I can tell you a simple example is very is here. It's grapes, the barrel, and the equipment and allows you to, to obtain additive and preservative for wine making. It's a, it's a new technology, it's a unique in the world. No one has got it yet. I hope so. Well, I haven't seen it yet. And um, you can achieve additives and preservative for wine making. Um, I'm working on the project right now where we can use, when it comes to sustainability, we can use um, food grade shipping containers and we can readjust them and re rearrange them with barrels to make mobile wineries where you can process everything in the field as chemical free, um, risk free and you can have these wines everywhere dropped mini micro uh, wineries and, and give the possibilities. Uh, European Union and some companies are looking into taking Taking this um, concept even further, so they can implement it in their wineries and and and, and um, wine restaurants and bars and hotels. Where, if, for example, if you look at the videos right here, uh, my barrels are coming with a, um, a perspex side glass and gives you a chance to have a look inside the barrel. To actually have a look inside the barrel, it's not it's not my invention, but I'm combining different inventions and different different techniques around the world to to make it a more sophisticated thing. So, a simple example: if you if you're a wine drinker and you'd like to go to to a restaurant, a simple example, uh, there's a list of wines that you never tried and and they're in front of you, and some of them they are more expensive, some of them are, are, are wines. But imagine. If you're going towards your table and you've got on your left side and your right side these barrels with different wines and you are able to taste them and water that wine to be served at the table. You don't take any risk, you, you, you already took the wine that you like and you enjoy and, and this gives the possibility for more people to get involved into winemaking. There are people born with taste, great taste, that they're not winemakers but they've got an amazing palate. Using this technology allows them to start making and producing their wine and I think if we implement this and if we have the, the right funding to make the design better, as I'm working with two Austrian and German company now to, to bring it to a more, more um, uh, compact design, then uh, we can look into the next one to five years to have uh, new wineries open around the world with this additive and preservative free wine. I, I'm not going to take more time. You, you can have access in, and it's a simple Vibang Vidois, and it's, uh, it's, you can access, you can see the whole story, and any questions are more than welcome. Um, I hope, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to have some samples of these wines before Christmas for um, people in Moldova to taste and, and uh, decide whether they like it or not. In the end, at the end of the day, um, the best wine is the wine that you like, and uh, if you if if this wine doesn't contain any additives and preservative, I think um, everyone is more than um, happy to consume them. Thanks a lot once again for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, actually, let's not forget the fact that this is um, EAC. Uh, now it's in a pilot phase. So I think that this is also a learning process for you also. So I would like to, as among my final question, just to ask you which are your expectations concerning EIC in Horizon Europe? Uh, because there is also this ex ante impact evaluation, you know already some orientation figures concerning the budget, which are your expectations in terms of the program for the next seven years? 
Well, as we said, I think there's a lot of positive excitement about the current pilot. It's really a pleasure to work for a program. That I'm only in this job since June. It's a big pleasure to work for a program that enjoys such a positive reputation and that currently generates so much, not only buzz, but really positive, um, welcoming messages really from the business community, from the financial community, and um, from obviously from the innovators. Um, so I think, I mean, and the reason that we have a pilot in the last two years of Horizon 2020, which was not easy to engineer into the current legal base, um, is the, the result of a strong demand also from member states. I mean, there was a declaration, common Franco-German declaration of Macron um, and Merkel, who said that we want you to test this, we want you to develop um, such a pilot. So we are basing ourselves on a mandate from the council with this pilot. So all that, I mean, the, the parliament in general is very research friendly and also sees this um, innovation Council is positive. So I think our proposed budget of 10 million um, in Horizon Europe for the European Innovation Council. 10 billion. I, 10, 10 billion, yes, sorry. Um, is, um, has a high chance of um, succeeding. Obviously, this is um, um, something that is not yet decided. There are many unknowns. But I think the I, there's almost universal. I mean, obviously, there is a concern on, on the on the basic research side, on the academics, that more budget is being devoted to um, the EIC. But there's going to be an interesting meeting, actually, also of the ERC, the European Research Council, um, and the EIC advisory board. So they're going to see, because these things are obviously not competing with each other. This is complementary. And so we hope to also generate that understanding. So I remain positive and optimistic. That's the total predicted, uh, the budget was 100 billion. How much, do you have an idea how much is going to be for the next programming? Do they have a... Of the total budget of... The Horizon 2020 was around 100 billion, so... 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. So, so, and yeah. so the proposed budget for Horizon um, Europe is 100 billion. Yeah. The Parliament has at some point asked for 120 million. Now... So, so the Parliament, the Parliament, the dynamic in the Parliament is to ask for more. Correct. Yes. That's yeah. also the Council. But now we are entering the MFF negotiations, and, though, and they mean the multi-annual financial framework. And obviously only once the multi-annual financial, financial framework for the overall next seven years has been um, discussed, only then can we um, enter into the sectorial programs. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. There are some other questions maybe from the audience concerning the program. We have worn everybody out here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in this case, Anders, do you have some takeaway messages maybe from your side? Oh, I mean, uh, just to uh, confirm what... We, we have two pitching videos. They should do business plan and uh, financial uh, work and upload the... <laughs> no, but uh, like a more... Yeah, in more general note, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's still in the cancel this proposal, so maybe we get more, maybe we get the same as we asked, who knows. But indeed, like, what is the crazy for us is that people are applying. I mean, there was this call, the first call for the Atlanta uh, Finance for the XC, uh, Accelerator, and there were a lot of people applying and companies applying, so it's a good sign. That, and people are interested for what that, for what, for what we see from the roadshow of the WD, not only Moldova, but also many. Uh, you members it also other associated countries that there's an interest and there are many people with ideas and you know this is what we want to do we want to get to those people and those people apply to you know, get to our issue that's it yes uh, thank you thank you very much i really hope that the next time when the road show will be in moldova we'll have a different picture on the map with beneficiaries uh, as it was already mentioned, our people should be, we have inventive, we have people with innovative ideas, we need to, boom, to be more ambitious. Failure is just... Failure is just a success in progress. Yes, <laughs> yes, for sure, for sure. And as Mr. Minister mentioned, uh, the geographical area east of Vienna should be also present and should take full advantages of the opportunities offered by the European programs. Meaning that we have a vision internally where we are going and what we are doing in order to achieve this. Thank you very much for your presence.